So when one grinds an ordinary glass, one can can make it so that it uh, becomes a powerful lens. One can also, when one polishes things, one can remove the dirt from them. And in one's life too, if one practices, one can reduce the defilements bit by bit. And in their place, a clean stream of consciousness will enter. So every second of the time when there is effort and sati, accurate aim, collectedness of samadhi and panya, these uh, mental states enter the mind when one, uh, when one practices. And to the extent that the defilements are limited, then one gains these wholesome qualities of effort, sati, and so on. So when these qualities, effort, sati, accurate aim, samadhi, and panya, wisdom, have a place in one's mind, the mind becomes very clean. And one sees uh, the distinction between mind and matter, nama and rupa. One then comes to see how this nama and rupa, mind and matter, is related as cause and effect. And when one sees in this way, seeing that there's just mind and matter, nama and rupa, then the belief in a self, a belief in a soul, is removed because one doesn't see anything in there. When one sees how these mind, this mind and matter are related as cause and effect, one comes to see that there's no one creating this. There's no creator. Mind and matter, nama and rupa, are all simply occurring due to causes. And of course, there are many types of matter that are created by karma, past karma. But Sirauji won't uh, confuse things by talking about that. But uh, there's also physicality, that ma- matter that is created by the mind, matter that is created by the weather, and by nutritious, nutritious food, food that can- contains nutritive essence. And so, as we know, that when uh, one has good food, then one's physical state of being becomes good. When one eats bad food, then one's physical state of being becomes bad. So, when one sees how mind and matter are related as cause and effect, this removes any doubt about how things happen. And one sees that this is happening now, cause and effect is occurring in whatever one sees. And this must have been so in the past. And as it is happening now, it will also be in the future, one comes to understand this. So this removes intense delusion about what really is. And this is very good. So after reaching this stage, if one continues to practice, one sees how what we observe each arises due to its own cause. And one comes to see that this mind and matter, which arises due to causes, it doesn't stay that way it comes to an end. And one sees this about all the things which one observes. They just come to an end. As one continues to practice, one sees this happen in a very fast, fleeting way. 
and one becomes skilled in observing the object and becomes very satisfied because of this. One's work is clean and one's mind is clean, thus light emits from one's body. The blood becomes clean and it makes the skin clear. Even people who were initially ugly become good looking because of the practice, because the greed, hatred and delusion which make one look ugly, which make one look not very good, are eliminated. They aren't arising anymore in one's mind. And joy and other factors also occur in a special way as Sayadoji mentioned last night. And when we reach this stage, then one has to understand that there are better things to come. And this can, sometimes people know this because the teacher urges them. There's, there are better things to come, to keep on going. So at this stage, when one keeps on going, one can, and continues to practice, one won't back up. After about two weeks of the retreat, Sierraji spoke about five factors to be fulfilled uh, if one wants to gain special dhamma. And he spoke about this to encourage the yogis. And these are called Padani Anga were just five, called five, also five limbs of striving. But these factors, these qualities are, are the qualities of one who can gain special knowledge in this life. And these qualities occur um, in a distinct way at this stage in the practice. The first quality is faith, and when Sayadaji spoke about this topic earlier, he just spoke about faith, faith in an ordinary way. But at this stage in the practice, one has gained knowledge and therefore one's faith increases because of one's direct experience. So one's faith is quite strong, although it is not unshakable yet. It, it, the faith is quite strong. And the second quality is health. At this stage in the practice, one's blood circulation has become quite good because of the practice. And this makes one's health very good. Just like, as, just as though one is eating, one is able to digest one's food very well. Two. So one's health is quite good at this stage in the practice. And honesty. Now before, in the practice, one didn't know one's faults. But at this stage in the practice, one sees very clearly what one has done wrong. And one wants to make amends. One wants to correct it. And so people come to the teacher at this stage and admit, I killed, I killed animals. Or some people even come and admit, I killed a person. And uh, one, people are very frank about whatever faults they remember having done. I stole things. I used to steal things. I committed adultery. I lied to people. And I see these are bad. Now, I see that these are bad and bring bad results. And, venerable sir, I resolve not to do these again. People actually come to the teachers and speak in this way. So one's attitude becomes very upright and no amount of reading brings this about. This comes about through the practice. So it's said that when one is honest, one will never run out of food. And this is because when one is honest 
other people will trust that person and will be happy to give you work. So, uh, and with this practice, at this stage in the practice, even people who were dishonest, quite dishonest before, become honest. And then the fourth factor, effort. So, um, one had the intention before to observe objects, trying, one was trying to observe without missing anything. But before this stage in the practice, there was a lot of missing. But now, in this, at this stage of the practice, the effort has become um, uplifted to a new stage. And the word for this is, is pagaha, pagaha virya. This virya has momentum. And it's like um, the way it lifts us up, the way uh, it, it energizes our practice is like the way when we lift something up and that we lift that thing up steadily so that it goes up, it just keeps on going up, it doesn't go down, we don't, it doesn't fall. So the effort at this stage is like that. It just goes up steadily. And there's also paripona virya, or fulfilled effort. This effort is fully developed. So, so the reason why one's effort is, is this strong is because um, one has no concern anymore for one's life or limb in the practice. One is not worried about hurting oneself or getting sick or dying through the practice. Before, during the practice, when there was discomfort, one was afraid. But now, having overcome pain for, one, for at least one time, one understands the benefit of just going all out to observe it. Uh, so, therefore, the effort that one applies, applies in observation is, is very courageous. And following on that, one's, one's knowledge also becomes increased because one sees how things arrive, arise and pass away very, very quickly. So one observes in observation, one makes effort and aims, and one sees very clearly due to the strength of one's energy, panya bala, how things arise and pass, whatever one sees arises and passes away very quickly. So this, um, sorry. So this stage is very, very satisfying. And if this person, if a, if a person reaches this stage and continues to practice, they will definitely gain path and fruition in this very life. So one, before in the practice, at times one would be discouraged and depressed and at times one would be elated. But now at this point in the practice, one goes steadily forward. Now, within two weeks of practice, some people are a able to gain this stage of the practice, and uh, for some it takes three weeks. So if one has not reached this stage in three weeks, then it means that there is something missing in what one is doing in the practice. So uh, when people reach this stage in the practice, if, uh, if they don't have more time, they should extend their retreat rather than end their retreat at this stage. Um, because the, at this stage in the practice, the factors that are needed for one to gain special knowledge in this life, those five factors are fulfilled. So if one does not reach this stage, so if there, if or for those who um, do not know about the practice and therefore 
are missing out on the practice, for those who know about the practice of satipatthana but don't use it, or who know and who use it but don't use it respectfully. For those people, uh, one disturbance or another is entering one's mind some type of disturbance. And since we are beings that live in a world of the senses, one type of disturbance that enters the mind is the desire for sense sense pleasures. One wants to enjoy things one one likes. One, if uh, if one doesn't have what one wants, one demands it and getting it, one isn't satisfied with that, one wants more. So this is Kama, Chanda, Nivarana, the obstacle of sense desire. When a person has this quality in their mind, they won't want to give any time to the practice of being a true human, of making the mind, the mentality humane, and of developing special human knowledge. And then there's dissatisfaction or depression, resentment, anger, not liking what what is happening. So this too is a disturbance. And these types of disturbances weaken one's knowledge and prevent the clean mind from arising. Sometimes the mind becomes intensely lazy it retracts, it draws back, it becomes cold and unworkable. This is the obstacle of sloth and torpor, tina, meta, nivarna. And this too prevents the wholesome mind from arising and weakens knowledge. When the mind is not, does not have any control, then it won't stick to the object gets scattered, and this is called udicca, restlessness. And when one remembers what one has done wrong, one feels remorse. Or remembering things that, good things that one didn't do, one feels remorse. So this this is called in Pali, udicca, kukocha, restlessness and remorse. And these two are a disturbance which prevent the wholesome mind from arising. And then there's also the inability to see clearly about the practice or about faith. One doesn't, one can't come to a decision. One doesn't know what, uh, what to do. One can't see clearly. So for people who don't apply the practice, these nivaranas, these obstacles, are occurring almost all the time. And these obstacles weaken, uh, weaken, the, weaken knowledge and they prevent the wholesome mind from arising. And in ordinary people, out of 24 hours, except for the hours when one is fast asleep, this is what is happening. Now the yogis, at the start of the practice, although there wasn't much special yet, uh, when the teachers urged them to work respectfully, meticulously, and without a break, then trusting in this instruction and following it, doing according to the instructions, effort, sati, and samadhi, virya, sati, and samadhi occur. And so the yogis, when they apply, um, when, they, when, when the object arises, they apply art and effort. And starting with laziness, the kilesas cannot enter the mind because of the application of art and effort. Effort brings sati, which protects the mind. And the mind that is protected falls collectedly collectedly on the object, 
with samadhi. So at this stage in the practice, the yogi sees that the five obstacles to concentration, the five nivaranas, have been dispelled in, the, in themselves. One sees that there's no desire for sense objects arising, no kama, chanda, nivarana. And there's no dissatisfaction with this person or the other. There's no pyabara, nivarana. And there's no laziness. One has no laziness arising. The mind is collected on the object. There's no scattered mind arising. And one is definite about, one, about, about what one is observing. There's no doubt. There's no vichy kecha. So one sees that every moment of observation, these five bad qualities have been eliminated. And one sees that these bad qualities, which, uh, you know, which prevent the clean mind and which weaken one's knowledge, these aren't arising in one. And when, see, when one sees this, then small-scale joy arises. One feels joy such as goose flesh, minor joy. And when one continues to practice, one's joy becomes very strong. And because of this joy, the strong joy, the mind and the body become tranquil. So this, the mind and body both feel tranquil and peaceful, and this brings out happiness, a sense of well-being in body and mind. And because of this happiness, sukha, then the mind becomes calm. So the, the mind is able, because the mind is so stable, it's able to penetrate every object that arises when one observes. So it's said that when one's mind is collected in this way, that one sees things as they really are. One sees the difference between mind and matter, nama and rupa. One sees with this concentrated mind that mind and matter are related as cause and effect. And this mind and matter, which is related as cause and effect, arises and then passes away. Arising and then passing away, it's not satisfactory. And it does this uh, completely on its own. It's just process. It has no inherent self. So one sees this very clearly at the stage of Udya Bhyanyana, of seeing the fast arising and passing away of phenomena. And what occurred before in our mind occurs in momentum, has strong momentum at this stage. And so if one continues the, the practice at this stage, one is sure to gain special dhamma. And this is what is said in the text, and it's also what the yogis actually can encounter and know. At this stage in the practice, when yogis have strong momentum, before the field of observation was distant, and therefore the object of observation uh, Although they were observing, they weren't able to remember very clearly what was seen. But now, at this stage, one sees the field of observation very, very, in a very special way. So one, one sees the physical phenomena quite clearly. When feelings arise, one sees the one observes the feelings and knows them, knows them very clearly. And 
when the mind arises, when the clean mind arises, one knows it immediately. When the unwholesome mind arises, one knows it immediately. The wholesome is to be nurtured. The unwholesome is to be dispelled. One knows this and uh, observes, one's observation is very clear. One also is able to observe all the general things that happen, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, planning. Well, this is, so the kaya nupasana satipatthana is fulfilled with the, the observation of feelings is also, also happens. Observation of the mind, citta nupasana, also is happening when it arises and then the um, observation of dhammas, dhamma nupasana satipatthana, also all the four foundations of mindfulness at, that, at this stage, whatever one arises, one is able to note the obvious object very well. And whether, um, if one misses, one knows immediately, um, but mostly one, one is able to note without missing. So one's observation at this point is very special. At this stage in the practice, a yogi doesn't need any encouragement from the teacher to continue practicing. They just need to be corrected here and there. And they work to gain special dhamma. And at, because they are, um, because of their practice, it is said that the dhamma at this stage protects them. Dhammo hoe rekati dhamma sari. This is, that means that the dhamma of the theory and the practice protects the one who is practicing according to the dhamma by, uh, by guarding them from kilesas on all levels, preventing the gross, medium, and refined levels of the disturbances of the kilesas. So at this point, one sees how one is protected by the Dhamma. So at this stage, the power of the Dhamma becomes apparent. Greed, hatred, and delusion pull one down, but the Dhamma pulls one up. It lifts one up. One up. It protects one and it makes one's life better. Who does the Dhamma protect in this way? It protects one who practices according to the instructions of the Dhamma. The Dhamma doesn't play fav favorites. Only when one knows the method and then applies it with respect and care Continuously does the Dhamma protect one like this. For those who don't respect the practice, who don't apply it systematically or respectfully, then this protection can't arise. So at this stage in the practice, the yogi sees uh, the cherishing, cherishable qualities of the Dhamma. One sees how, it, how very much it is to be cherished. And one doesn't back up at this stage in the practice. One just keeps on going forward. And as one continues to practice, one's Vipassana knowledge matures. <laughs> 